Um, all right, so we're going to jump right in with our uh, presentation here. So a little bit of history. Um, the Fulbright grant was established, or the Fulbright program was established in 1946. They have many different types of grants. Um, and it was put in place to strengthen the relationship between people of the United States and the citizens of the rest of the world. And it has just grown and expanded ever since then. Um, here we go. So we're today going to focus mostly on artists applying for Fulbright grants. Um, and Fulbright really welcomes artists. They are um, the, their belief is that artists embrace cultural engagement and are, and are really excellent ambassadors. So um, if you're an artist and you're kind of on the fence about whether or not to apply, definitely do. Um, you have a really good chance of, of getting one of those grants because they, they welcome artists of all disciplines. Um, Arts-related projects um, should develop your craft while interacting with a larger question. So you want to be very clear and specific and focus on making and um, taking your work to a new level. If you find yourself sort of um, circling around just research and writing, then uh, you'll want to apply for one of the more research-based grants um, versus the artist's um, focused grants. Uh, and so as an artist, the development of your craft should be central to your idea. Um, artists are um, encouraged to propose research too, but the research should be through the lens of the art. So your emphasis as an artist applying to Fulbright should be on practicing. It should be on observing, participating, um, making, and interacting. If you're able to answer the question of how will you improve your craft and apply your making skills? Then you're on the right track um, for the artist-oriented um, Fulbright grant options. So um, an arts applicant can propose an independent project. Um, they can uh, propose enrolling in a degree granting program. Um, and they can also propose taking courses. But the most important part is the final point. You want to check what your country requires. Each country and each program is unique. Um, they are different. And the best way to find out is to dig in on the Fulbright um, website and get the details of the countries that you're interested in. So again, just to reiterate, the study of versus making is an important factor to distinguish between. So if your project leans towards study of painting rather than the act of painting, um, then you would consider applying under the academic route. Um, you'll be competing with applicants from with degrees in academic fields if you choose that academic route. It's a little bit more competitive. Um, so be mindful of that as you make your choice of going into the artist route or the academic route with your application. Um, and also, if you choose the academic route, you don't you no longer have the option of submitting visual materials. Um, and as an artist, a maker, those visual materials can really bolster your application. So um, Fulbright Scholar Program supports teaching or research for two months to 12 months. Um, it's really a broad range of time frames, which is great because um, not everybody has the same amount of time available to them. Uh, they have over 130 countries. Uh, they have programs for faculty, for administrators, for professionals. It's open to all disciplines. Um, and you can apply to a specific, a spe specific award uh, with your proposed project. Um, this actually is an older slide. I don't know if the 2020 deadline will be September 16th. Um, so you'll want to keep on top of their current information on the website. Um, and yes, it is at a variety of post institutions. The eligibility for this is you do have to be a US citizen. Um, you'll wanna have, it, it's likely that the PhD or other terminal degree may be required. So check those eligibility requirements. Um, it's open to professionals and out, artists outside of academia, which I think is so important um, that you do not have to be affiliated with an academic institution to apply for a Fulbright. Um, grant. Obviously, it's much easier if you um, have some sort of uh, affiliation, whether you're um, uh, a faculty or like some of our current grad students are certainly looking at this for immediately after they graduate. Um, but keep that in mind. It is not a requirement that you are academically affiliated. Um, you could have 
te- I do teaching experience as required um, by the the award. Some of the awards specifically require you to teach, while others do not. So you want to look into that. Um, they really encourage folks who've served in the U.S. Armed Forces to apply, and there's always different and new updated policies. So just check that out in case anything has changed. So the award, the funding, um, this came up and when we first presenting uh, presented this presentation, which was how do people do this? How do they afford to do this? Um, the grant benefits for all U.S. student grants include round trip um, transportation to the host country, funding to cover room board, incidental costs um, based on the cost of living in that particular country, um, health benefits, and a 24-7 support line. Um, and even within those four grant benefits, it does wiggle and change depending on the country. So again, you'll hear me say that over and over again, check the requirements of the country that you're interested in. Um, some countries, the grant may also include things like book and research allowances, um, enrichment activities, full or partial tuition, language study, um, and all sorts of orientations and so on. So really just make sure you're checking your, your particular area, country of interest. Um, more about the money. The other question that came up, which is super relevant, is um, how much money specifically do you get? It depends on the location. Will you have to have a side job um, for some, depending on like if you have um, bills and so forth back home, um, which I don't know many people who wouldn't have bills back home. Um, yes, it can be beneficial to get a small side job. Um, that one example they give is teaching ESL on the side. Um, the other recommendation is to be very frugal while you're out on the grant um, and also to apply for extra funding. Um, they said that the uh, Fulbright often sends opportunities for extra funding. You should take advantage of them. And if you don't see announcements for extra funding, ask about them because the funding often exists, um, but you do have to be proactive. So um, you'll want to start by asking yourself, are you prepared to spend your time and energy on a Fulbright application? I'm sur- sure Laura is going to talk about um, how long it took her to write the application. And are you ready for this experience? And you c- can you prove it? Um, they want to see um, artists, students, um, folks, whether you're faculty or not, um, to be able to prove that you're ready for this immersive and very serious experience. Um, Q&A, how can you contact Fulbright? Um, all of their email addresses are listed on the award descriptions um, and each country has often several awards. So um, the emails are really easy to find. Uh, that, that was the 2019 deadline. Again, you'll wanna check for a 2020 deadline. And can you apply for two or more awards? No, you have you do have to pick and make a choice. Um, and then the question of is there a preference for teaching research or teaching slash research, etc. Um, again, that will be in the reward uh, the award uh, description. So uh, we've got five tips. These are just taken from the Fulbright website, and then. Um, From other research, we've sort of added on and bulked up these recommendations. So uh, tip number one is join my Fulbright. This is super easy. You can do it tonight. You could do it right now during the webinar. Just go to the Fulbright website and join my Fulbright. Register. Um, What that will do is it will give you regular updates about the things that you're interested in. Um, That would be about a particular program. If you already have one in mind, it will give you webinar um, updates. They do webinars almost once a week on various countries, on various new awards, on um, just last week they did one on awards in the UK. Um, So they they might focus on a particular region, um, but they're very helpful resources. And they give you lots of great suggestions for strengthening your application. Um, Two, connect with Fulbright alumni in your field and region. Um, They have a directory. It's the Fulbright Scholar Directory. And you can use that to search um, by name, by discipline, by specialization. Um, You can, I think there's also um, region if you want to look for that. So look, look online and see who 
is either interested in the same ideas, the same country, or perhaps alumni from past institutions that you have um, attended yourself academically and connect. Um, people I have found generally, folks who have gotten Fulbrights are so generous. I mean, Laura is a glowing example, just reached right out and said, hey, how, how can I help? I'd love to talk about this. Um, so do reach out and try to connect with alumni from Fulbright. Um, also, as I mentioned, they have a whole host of uh, webinars available. Um, these ones happen to be from last the last month or so because when we first presented this webinar, um, it was in person um, in February. So as you can see, they're focused on different areas of the world and they're constantly refreshing that. So they've already got a whole bunch of other new ones up. Um, and then featured programs. You want to see what's new this year. I was impressed they had um, quite a handful of new programs in place for 2020 through 21, and I recommend checking that out. So um, connect with alumni from your institution. So if you are currently affiliated with an academic institution, or you used to be, or you're an alumnus of a, an institution, reach back out to them um, and see if you can uh, connect with anybody who's gotten the award in the past. And oftentimes they'll be happy to share their application with you. And the more applications you, you have in front of you, you can start to see patterns in how, oh, that's how they talk about this. This is where, this is how they structured their application. Um, it, it's just invaluable to make as many connections with people and talk about the process. Um, as, as much as you possibly can. So at MCAD, we are super lucky. We have these fantastic six individuals on campus um, and they're all very gracious and very generous. Um, and so you'll wanna check your own networks of alumni. And then bonus, five questions to ask a Fulbright alumnus. Um, what motivated you to apply? What are the best and most challenging parts of your fellowship experience? What do you think made your application stand out? What questions did they ask you in the finalist interview? And five, what do you know now that you wish you had known when you applied? Um, so if, you, if you're just really concerned about reaching out to a Fulbright alumnus that you've never met before, these are five fantastic questions that any Fulbright alumnus um, could speak to given their experience. So um, that's a really great resource right there. Um, the fifth tip is to connect with the outreach, out, outreach and recruitment team at Fulbright. And they are so friendly. They are, they're just really nice people and they want to help you. They want you to succeed. Um, and so making that contact is really beneficial. They have both email and phone contacts available. So now brainstorming suggestions. Um, you want to design an interesting project that would be interesting both to Americans and to the people in your host country um, that will allow you to talk and inter interact with people in the host country. It should also be a project that you would love the opportunity to pursue. Um, you're going to be talking about this a lot. You're going to be writing about this a lot. So, um, And you're going to do that for a long time. So it should be something you're passionate about. Um, Suggestions for, for brainstorming. If you're just drawing a blank and you have no idea what, what could I possibly do a Fulbright about, um, just start doing a brain dump. Start listing off what are all the schools that you've attended, degrees earned, majors, minors, have you done study abroad, what languages do you speak, um, what professors or mentors have you worked with, um, have you done any residencies, do you belong to any organizations, what conferences do you regularly attend, if any, um, have you recently attended a coding camp or some other type of learning activity. List all of that down and these... Um, these these pieces of information might jog your your brain for somebody one you could reach out to to talk to about this or two um oh I, I you know you might remember oh fred he went to ireland the other year you know like maybe i should talk to him about what he encountered in that country and what ideas might be useful if i decide to apply to ireland just as an example um so get all of that written down just do a really fast brainstorm um, and then same thing 
for your skills, interests, areas of focus, hobbies. Write all of those things down. What have your recent projects been about recently? Um, what topics have you engaged with? What do you have to offer? And again, don't judge anything. Just get it down on paper like any good brainstorm. It's about quantity, not quality. And then three, what are you aching to learn? What do you want to know more about? What techniques, what media, forms, topics, subject matter? Um, are there particular contexts you're super curious about? Um, and what questions are on your mind? Again, dump that all down in writing and we'll come back to it. Um, and then think about your career goals. Do you want to work in the medium that you're currently using and get better? Are you trying out a new skill or medium? And will you be learning from someone? Um, think about where you want your career to go. That can be a really great through line in your application. And then obviously, you want to think, are there any countries or regions that you'd like to visit or aim for? Um, do think about if you have traveled abroad previously, where, where have you gone? Um, be aware, if you are lucky enough to have done a lot of international travel, if you have cumulatively spent more than six to 12 months somewhere, that can affect your application. It's another one of those things where you need to check the country. Um, not all countries have the same rules, but for some of them, um, they want you to have spent less than six to 12 months in, that, in the place you'll be visiting. Um, ask yourself where you'd like to go. I, I think a fun exercise, a little mental exercise that was suggested is try to picture yourself in the country and ask, what would you like to spend your time doing? Regardless of if it's a good project or a bad project, what would you like to spend your time doing? And that answer could lead you to a particular topic or methodology that you hadn't concerned. Um, and then again, do you have any professors, mentors, et cetera, who have existing relationships within that country or region? Write that down in the brainstorm. Um, also, see what your countries of interest offer. You might be um, interested in like, I definitely want to go to a Nordic country or something like that. So then you're going to go and you'll be looking at like Norway, Iceland, Sweden, and just looking at a few countries. Um, and then you can get a sense of, are there language requirements? Um, do you need a special degree to go on their particular award? Um, also, fun fact statistics. Um, if you have two countries that you're equally interested in, you can look on this link, um, fulbrightonline.org slash statistics, and see which one is more competitive. Um, so if you're in a dead heat, you just can't make the decision. You could find out if one is less competitive or more competitive using their, their just open public statistics there. And then as we mentioned, um, language requirements can sometimes be a factor. So you'll want to know uh, what, what your choices are. So um, brainstorming suggestions, a few Fulbright stats. Western Europe is definitely the most popular region. Uh, the UK is the most competitive country to apply to within Western Europe. Um, and that obviously is because they're speaking English. So. Um, for those who don't feel comfortable with a, a second or third language, then a, an English-speaking country is going to be a little bit easier for them to work in. Um, however, there are lots of people <laughs> who want to do that. Um, the ETA grants in Spain, Andorra or Spain, are the most competitive in all of Europe. Scandita Scandinavian countries do not require the grantee to speak the local language. That might be useful. Um, Germany offers the most grants uh, each year with 80 of the Fulbright grants and 140 of the ETA grants. And Russia is the most competitive country with the toughest language requirements. So all good things to think about. All right. So one more uh, six is, is there any kind of research methodology you'd like to use? Um, this is particularly useful if you realize as you're thinking about this, like, oh, I don't really want to make clay pots. I want to study how clay pots were made. Then, you, then you'll be looking at the more academic route, and that involves some sort of academic methodology, like, will you be visiting an archive and studying from a library archive? Um, are you going to conduct interviews with people, focus groups? Are you going to have 
case studies or surveys or oral histories. Um, if you end up going the academic route, that can be very useful to spend some time brainstorming. So um, Fulbright generally sees two major flaws in many of its arts applications. Uh, one is proposing to replicate the same projects that you've been making while you're in the United States. Um, you need to show that you're going to have some sort of growth. Um, so the example there is if an artist makes small pottery in the US and they want to make the exact same pottery in Morocco, um, they will not see that there's much of a challenge there. It's not very transformational. Um, so keep that in mind. The second major flaw is feasibility. Um, this would be where you make small clay pots, but you're proposing to sing opera. And so if they, if you don't make the connection for them um, and show that not only is it a great idea, but you are capable of executing it, um, they will, that, that's a major flaw in your, in your application. So keep that in mind as well. Um, outlining. So this would be after you've done this giant brain dump and you've answered all of those questions, you have all of these facts written down, uh, you can think about, uh, you can go about this several different ways. First is focus on the country that you're interested in, which that could lead you to a project idea, which could then lead you to an affiliate. And an affiliate is the partner that you have to locate um, in order to make this Fulbright happen. And finding a partner is complex and challenging. That's why our next webinar next week is only about finding partners. Um, so that that's one way to go about it. Or you could focus on your project idea, which could lead you to an expert, um, which would then lead you to your affiliate and your country choice. Um, or Maybe you know of an expert that you've always wanted to um, study with, and that could lead you to your project idea and also a country. So there's lots of different, there's no one right, correct way to do this. There are many different um, strategies and, and paths that people follow. Um, advice from past grantees. Um, people were struck by their how much their initial thoughts and ideas change. So don't feel like, like you're weighed down by committing to an idea really early. You're going to talk about this idea and draft this idea, and it will morph and change, and that's okay. Um, also, don't be discouraged by the writing process. That's why I'm being very open. It's difficult. It takes a long time. You're going to be doing lots of different drafts of it, and it will morph and change. Um, just mentally prepare yourself for that. Um, and then also uh, understand that the process will be beneficial whether or not you get the grant. Um, and if you are, if you feel ready to undertake that, regardless of the outcome, then you're in a good position to undertake this this long and challenging process. So uh, these are a whole bunch of Fulbright resource pages. Um, we'll share this after the webinar, and these are all the works that were cited in the presentation. So with that, I'm going to discontinue sharing my screen. And then Laura, I wonder if you might want to talk about your experience. Yeah, um, I just un un unmuted my mic. So hopefully everybody can hear me and I'm waving so people can. Um, so at any rate, um, yeah, I happened to see this online and I thought, uh, you know, um, I got really great help from a former Fulbright um, recipient also. So it's so funny that you said that. So some uh, some some of you may know my colleague at Anoka Ramsey, another uh, photo person, Anthony Marchetti. And so Anthony got a Fulbright about four or five years ago now to study in Hungary. And um, and I've always wanted to do a Fulbright application, but Ellen really kind of really hit this. <laughs> just every time I look at the application, I would just go, oh God, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> Um, and so finally I decided, okay, I'm going to do this, and, um, and we're lucky. In Minnesota, we write a lot of grants, so I think we have a, a leg up on, on a lot of uh, other artists. And so um, and so at any rate, um, I started down the process, and one is getting on the website and just looking at what's uh, available. So I did exactly the same thing, and um, I happened to see that there was a Fulbright being offered by the British Library, and it was in the um Center for American Studies, and I thought, okay, this is exactly what I want to do—extension of something I'm already 
currently doing. And, um, you know, I sent Ellen a copy of my application. I'm happy if, if anybody wants my email, Ellen, you can get to go ahead and give it to anybody. And I'm happy to help them out. Wonderful. So I had, it, this was like, aha. So I didn't have to go look for a partner or an affiliate. And, and one of the things you're going to find out as you start trolling through their rather dense website um, is that um, you're going to either have to find your own affiliate or it's going to be hosted already. And so this was already hosted through the British Library. So it, it was perfect. And it was open to disciplines. So, uh, so some of these will say they want something very specific. This one was like, you could be an academic, it could be an artist, it could be a musician, you know, so they had a list of, and I thought, okay, fine, that puts me in that category, I'm good. And um, so my particular fellowship required a letter of invitation. So the very first thing I had to do was write a letter, they gave the, they, they gave the, the director of the Echo Center's name, Philip Hatfield, and they said, you know, so I had to write to Philip and pitch the story, uh, more or less, and wait for him to reply and give me a go ahead. And say yes, you, you you know you can you can apply. And so that was my very first thing. And I think I started looking at writing this. Probably my deadline was the one that you showed in your webinar it was last year, um, September sixteenth. And I started working on this in the summertime. So because uh, I needed to like put this out there, and then I needed to wait for this letter to come back because he could have said no, and that was the end of that story. And then that was it. You know, I was out. Um, and the people at the, the Fulbright are super, uh, super friendly, as you had said. So I wrote my, my letter to, to Philip and I, you know, waited, I, I don't know, I don't know how long you waited. And then I got a little worried and I emailed the representative and she was like, um, if you don't hear in another week or so, um, give me, email me back. And then within that week, you know, I heard from Philip and I got to go ahead to apply. And then that's when I started to dive into um, crafting it. And, and Anthony Marchetti was my, yeah, he was my Virgil, uh, and the and 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 I was Dante, and we were going through the Divine Comedy together. <laughs> That's the way of putting it. And he was a, a treasure trove of information that I'm just going to pass on. And um, and so a couple of things I would definitely say that you should highlight. Um, it's this balancing act. The Fulbright wants you to be independent enough to execute your project, but not so independent that you're not involved. A very community focused, very community relationship and um it is about creating these um international friendships these and 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 not only your life being transformed but whose lives you are transforming at the same time and so you want to uh, write a project that is is very doable and i love the fact that one of the one of the downfall too many you know a, a project that's not doable um, but there has to be some level of challenge. And so where you're pushing yourself beyond uh, where you are at the moment. So you, 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 find, you find that balance. So, um, so they want to, to, to find that. I think, um, to me, one of the most important things in crafting your, your proposal is why do you need to be there to do this? I mean, so again, in your in your foibles, um, it, it's like, why do you need to be there? Okay, because you know, you got to make a project where being there and interacting either with particular archives or a particular school or a particular uh, thread of study or something that's really specific to the area, the region, the city, whatever. You need to make that case that. I this is I have to make the work and I need to do it here and these are the reasons why. So you want to make it very clear of that connection and then how is it you are going to um, um, mine that process and share it with everybody. So uh, so sharing it with the local community as well as bringing it back to the United States and sharing it with people on this side of the pond. Um, the very important part of the Fulbright history is, is um, and this idea of um, community through scholarship, is that the Fulbright program started after World War II. And the first Fulbright scholars to come to the United States were German. And so it's a really important part of the, the history of the program is uh, reaching out 
and creating uh, the hum humanitarian relationships um, and that art and scholarship and education can transcend um, all of this chaos and can, it can change lives for the better. So those are a, a, a few of the um, kind of things that I would, I would definitely recommend. Um, and I don't know if anybody has any questions. I, I can answer some questions. I'm trying to think of, um, I did think that I had an interview. Now, Anthony did not. He didn't get an interview. And some, and that's the other thing too, is they're all so different. So um, Anthony, and Anthony was a teaching award. And again, with Anthony's project, he, he applied to um, go to Hungary and he was working on a photo project about his grandmother's basically his grandmother fled Hungary it was there and, and he was working on the story of how his grandmother walked across Europe and got on a boat and came to the United States so he made that argument about this photo project he was starting and that he needed to be in Hungary to to make this work and then he had a teaching um, a, a fellowship I on the other hand am in a, a, a purely research fellowship and yes, I was um, being evaluated with other American studies scholars, <laughs> but they told me right there was a there was a, they wanted something different. So they 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 definitely were like, we want somebody who's not just going to write an article; it's going to go in a journal, and three people are going to read this. So, um, so part of it is finding out what it is they want, and then trying to really craft your response uh, to them. So. Um, Ellen or anybody else have any questions? I, I, I feel like I'm blathering at this point. No, you're doing great, Laura. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Bill has a question. Can I use Fulbright to fund an artist residency program? Um, that's a good question, Ooh. Bill. Laura, have you run into that? Um, probably in, well, yes. If, 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 if you apply to a program and I'm, I'm tentatively saying yes, because if you apply to a program, a, a fellowship, where you have to find an affiliate partner, uh, then the then the residency could potentially be that affiliate partner. Um, but it would have to be a residency that is interactive, a residency that has some kind of community base to it. Um, there, because of the history of the of the program, I doubt that they would send you there so you could have three or four months in complete solitude to make your work. So um, I think if it was a residency that had some community connection, was about education maybe, and they would sign on as your affiliate partner, I think it's a possibility. You, you'd have to navigate that a little bit. Yep. Anyone else, questions? And feel free at this point, if you wanna turn on your mic and at, just ask the question, feel free. Blur it out. Blur it out. <laughs> Is anybody in? No, it's so quiet. Yes. I'll ask a question. Thank you. This is Carrie. Oh, hi, Carrie. hi, Laura. This nice is awesome. to meet you. <laughs> yeah, this is very informative. So, Laura, I just kind of wanted to know a little bit about your research, Fulbright, and like, was the time commitment flexible or very inflexible? I mean, I'm just wondering, do you have to? Um, it was, um, I think it was, boy, that's a really good question. I think it was, a six, I think it was six months, and I think I need to make a commitment to six months. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that I see in other programs um, that some of them are flexible. They say one to six months or one to three months or something like that. I believe mine was um, ideally six months, and mm -hmm. I don't remember if there was flexibility in it. So, um, so you have to make sure that you can clear your life for six months and go abroad because they are also very restrictive about traveling outside of the region. They don't want you flying home every month. Um, you know, I will sneak to Italy on many occasions, see my family, but, um, but you know, that'll be a long weekend. They, they are, they actually said that they, there is actually some percentage restriction of how much you can travel outside of the, of the area. So I don't know if that answers your question, Carrie. Yeah, no, it does. Thank you. And to add on to that, when you sort of peruse the different program options, because one of the search um, criteria that you're able to search by is the length of the of the type of time. program. 
Yeah. yeah. And they now they actually have one. Yeah, called you can, like I think flex, I think it's called flex program. Or yeah, the flex thing. You know that actually, yeah, that allows you to kind of do and then come home and then do and. Yep. And man, that's one of the things about the Fulbright program that I I I, I found really challenging for um, a number of years is there's so much. I I didn't even really know what what, what where which program was I supposed to be in it. It took me a while to sort of like, um, and again, Anthony was super helpful. And then my friend, Rachel Breen, who I think Carrie knows, um, it wants some help. And so I've already just sent her to, hey, go to this site. And pa her, she wants to apply. Go to this site. <laughs> this, this is where you want to go. Yeah, so absolutely. It, it's dense. Yeah, it's the, having a, a sort of a Sherpa, a guide is invaluable. <laughs> I would not have been able to do what I did without Anthony e each step of the way, like just even from the very beginning and say, you know, this is the page of awards that I looked at and this is probably where you want to look. I'm just paying it forward by saying that to some other people. Yep. And then each step of the way, you know, he read my drafts. He was super helpful and I'm happy to help anybody out because uh, it, it is also part of the ethos of the of the program is to is that generosity of spirit. Absolutely, um, I can say one resource to that that was really helpful as I was making this presentation was um, RISD has a, a like a powerhouse of of uh, just information. They have like a site devoted to getting a Fulbright um, and because uh, okay uh, sure yeah I was gonna say it's um and because it's all for artists all that material right. whereas on the Fulbright site it's for everyone it's for scholars right. it's for English teachers um yeah but for scientists me, oh my god like some of those you know biomedic science things just can yeah. blew my head it's just I was like okay I'm not obviously I have no idea what they're talking about exactly yeah so the the more you can narrow your focus and your search um the better off you'll be it'll be slightly less overwhelming because you're absolutely right it is so overwhelming to um yeah once, once I had a path to me it was you know as challenging as applying for a state arts board grant or yeah. the MCAD Jerome. Mm -hmm. I mean, just those layers of drafting and paring down and clarifying your project. Because the other thing too, is somebody has to read this thing mm -hmm. and you want them to be able to read it, get through the information, ascertain it. Um, you want it to be interesting, but not too complicated. Absolutely. Yeah. How about anybody else? Questions? Everybody's so uh, quiet and yeah. shy. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a question. This is great, by the way. Um, I'm curious about with the proposals, how much weight is given, especially to the artistic proposals, um, towards having some kind of like culmination set up? So, like, you know, maybe I want to go to Germany or something to study X and Y, but are they looking at my project to see that I have maybe some sort of exhibition set up or some sort of, um, yeah, some sort of culmination of my of my work, or are they just really kind of interested in the project itself? I'm sure it varies, well, I, but. It, I, that's a really good question. And I think culmination or show or something, there is a component of how are you going to take this fellowship time and whatever it is you're working on this body of work that you're creating and share it with the community so it is about community so um so a show uh and if you happen to be able to say you know i've reached out to blah blah and so and so and such and such and um you know i will be able to um exhibit this work have a q a or get out to different colleges and universities and do powerpoint lectures uh that's it that that's the culmination of my project so while i'm working i'm going to be uh going out to schools and university you know schools and, and i'm i'm talk I, i'll talk to five-year-olds it doesn't matter wherever they want me to talk about this particular um uh this particular idea um, and then, um, and then I said, you know, I would have a show at the British Library at the end, and um, and and then I said, and they they can have the photographs. 
wow. you know, that they do their collection. I mean, um, you know, because I'm getting a little bit of research money. So as you said, funding is different. So I'm getting $750 that I could use for research materials, such as for some people maybe buying books or whatever. And I said, can I use this to print the photographs? And I'm like, yeah, no, that's fine. And so I feel like I'll make these photographs then available. So Michael, to your question, culmination at the end that is somehow sharing what you're doing with the community makes, will go a long way. Yes. And that you've done your homework again, they don't want to babysit. They want to know that you can execute this. So just showing that you have some places in mind that you've had conversations with uh, that will get the work out into the community uh, is, 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 is very important to them. Great. That's super helpful. Thank you. Sure. No worries. Anyone else? How about Laura? Do you mind? Can you give us your like one minute elevator speech about what are you doing at the British Library? Okay, um, it is the uh, it's the Echo Center for American Studies, and so I um, have been photographing um, archives. And I last year had a residency, and I photographed the private archives, um, the private archives of James Weldon Johnson, who is no by no means a household name. Some people might know who he is. Um, and um, he was a part of the Harlem Renaissance. He wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing. He was one of the founders of the NAACP. And, um, and so when I was out there, I was obviously looking through a lot of stuff. And he also, he and his brother, Rosamond, not only did they write beautiful, you know, things like God's Trombones and, you know, Lift Every Voice and Sing, but they also wrote for Black Broadway. And they wrote all sorts of interesting, um, uh, he, you know, work together. And so then I started looking at Rosamond Johnson and realizing that Rosamond Johnson lived in London for two years. And he was the first person of color to be um, the, uh, an artistic director of an opera house. And it was uh, Oscar Heim Hammerstein Sr. And so I was like, well, what did he do in those two years? Uh, that he was in London. Uh, well, he got married. You know, he had huge transformation of his life, and he got to know um, a, a, an English compo a musician composer by the name of Samuel Coleridge Taylor. And so, Rosamond Johnson and Samuel Coleridge Taylor formed this uh, friendship with and James Weldon. Also, became friends with them as well. And so, um, and and Coleridge Taylor is um, English and Sierra Leone. And these, these, these two men were both men of color, but Rosamond Johnson and James Weldon come from the descendancy of slaves, and Sammy Coleridge Taylor did not. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they were incredibly influential to each other, but, but they'd fallen off the radar. I mean, they were enormously famous at the time they were alive, and hardly anybody knows who they are. So part of my archives project is to bring to light um, the, the, the work that is done by people who were once famous mm -hmm. in their time, but who have fallen off the cannon, who have just mm -hmm. fallen off the radar. So I'm gonna be photographing the archives um, in, in the Echo Center of both um, James Weldon and uh, Rosamond and Samuel Coleridge Taylor and bringing that um, bringing that story out into the public. That's wonderful. That's a long elevator speech. We did the John <laughs> Hancock, okay? <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> it's a you tough can... one. I wish I could tear it down. That's yeah. okay. It's a complex story. Um, and you said six months? Is that how long you're going? Yes. That's yes. wonderful. And with the pandemic, the um, at this point, looks like I will be going there early January and staying through June 30th. I am prepared for things to be potentially shifted back. Yeah. Um, Fulbright said, you are going to have your fellowship. Nothing is being canceled. Good. <laughs> I am prepared. That maybe I don't go until February and I come back in July or something, but yeah. um, they have assured us that we're going. And obviously they're accepting applications for the next round. So. Yeah. 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 It's happening. We're all going. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The a past student um, who just, he was accepted to China for almost in, in tandem with as COVID-19 hit. And yeah. it sounds like Fulbright has been excellent. They've, they've yeah. reassured him, do not worry, we're going to help you, yeah. you know? And so he, 
I think that, do this. Yeah, exactly. That's really comforting to know that if you put in, um, you know, s- several months of work on on an application, they're committed to you yes. if you get it. So. Well, and then you jump through all the hoops. Oh my God. I mean, every time I saw an email from the Fulbright, I wanted to vomit. I mean, it was just so stressful. <laughs> like I was expecting to be booted every every time. Like every time I made the next one, I was like, wait a minute, I'm not an American studies scholar. I know. <laughs> you know like, how is this happening to me? But it's good. Yeah. I'm glad so, you're more upfront about that. I think it's so important just to be really transparent and open with people yeah. like it, this is rigorous it's a hard application you're going to have to talk to a lot right. of different people um but when you come out on the other side uh if you're lucky enough to win one it's it's just life-changing so it's life 